Thanks so much, Rosie. I really have a terrible memory, and there are very few, very few things I remember when, when I was a child, but one of the very first memories I do have is when I was about four or five years old, uh, growing up in Brazil, and I was about this size, so, and my family and I had gone to the Atlantic Forest of uh, Eastern Brazil, and I remember uh, all the kids were playing on the beach and having fun, and I just went into the forest, of course, because that's what I really like to do, and then all of a sudden I saw this butterfly flying towards me, and you know, me being this size and a butterfly like this size, blue, metallic, flying towards me, I was totally scared and uh, paralyzed because it flew towards me and then it turned and, and disappeared. And I was absolutely left paralyzed. How could be something so beautiful exist? And I think ever since then, I've always been collecting stuff. I've filled my pockets with any seeds, shells, stones, anything I would find, beetles that were creeping around. And fast forward 40 years uh, to now, that's basically what I still like to do. And, you know, I haven't really changed anything. And my passion is still to go to the ring forest and look around and try to find as many species as I can. And the only difference, I think, is, that, is now that I'm responsible for a much bigger collection of seeds and uh, butterflies and insects and other plants. I was responsible for the collections that we have here at Q and our fantastic body of about 500 scientists working more than 100 countries and trying to describe this amazing diversity of life on this planet. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that we know more about the surface of Mars than we know about life on this planet. And every year we're finding hundreds of new species uh, to science that no one knew about. And a few years ago, my PhD student in Brazil, she went around the Amazon and took soil samples uh, and brought them back to the lab and we sequenced all the DNA in those samples. And in a single teaspoon of soil, we found about 1,800 species, about 400 of those belonging to the fungal kingdom. And most of those without any kind of name. So it's absolutely fascinating to see how much discoveries we can still make today. And now I think it's a time of discovery and a time of celebration of this amazing diversity but it's also a time of sorrow, because since I grew up, we've lost about one quarter of all tropical rainforests on this planet. And deforestation is the number one cause of biodiversity loss uh, in the forests, in the tropics, and the destruction of habitats is now causing about a million species to be at risk of extinction. It's not going to be news to you, uh, but it's really something that we have never ever experienced in human history. So our scientists at Kew have estimated that about two in five plant species, which is about 40% of 350,000 species, are likely to disappear in the century, unless we drastically change the way we live our lives. And habitat destruction, so deforestation, destruction of wetlands, the destruction that we do in coral reefs, for instance, is the number one cause of biodiversity loss. And then climate change, which everyone's talking about, is number three or four. So today we have multiple threats causing the demise of species, and that's at the global level, species that disappear never to come back. But it's also at the local and regional level. So we just look around our cities, our parks, our forests in the neighborhood, which are losing species faster than ever before. We also have the threat of pathogens, so ash dieback disease many people will be familiar with. You'll be familiar with uh, the pests, invasive species that are competing with our local fauna and flora. You'll also be familiar with the exploitation of species, such as through illegal logging. And the fact that many of the furniture we buy are coming from tropical trees, and many of them are threatened. And about 40% of those we estimate here at Q are illegally traded. So many times they change the labels, they'll sell things that um, they claim to be sustainable, but actually it's not, it's not the case. And why would we worry about one million species being likely to be extinct today? Just think about what you just ate for lunch today. How many species did you have on your plate? Two, three, five, 10, 15? Every day I consume dozens of different species. I use cotton, I use, we use wood to our houses, we have fibers, we have medicine, 
about 50% of all medicines we use today derive from natural products. And billions of people every day use natural medicines as their primary source of medication and treatment. Biodiversity gives us all those fantastic benefits for free every day, as Rosie was talking about. And we haven't been paying attention to that, and we haven't, we haven't given nature the time to restore uh, those fantastic services we are getting. And it's about all the direct benefits we get. It's about food, it's about medicines, about fiber, it's about clothing, building material, but also the material benefits we get. Think about the pandemic. It feels like ages ago, doesn't it? It's like a, a century ago, but just during the pandemic, how valuable it was for us just to go out in nature and just sit under a tree and not think about COVID, think about something else and just feel nature around us because we are really just a part of it. With one leaf on the, on the tree of life, we are really connected. We are part of nature. It's not we and nature elsewhere. And I think this realization that we are part of nature and that species, despite the fact they give us so much every single day, they're not our slaves. They're not here for us. And sometimes, actually oftentimes, I, I do feed work in many different countries and people come to me and say, why are you, why are you looking at that plant? What, what is it good for? We always think about the human benefits, about what we get out of it. We have this almost colonial attitude towards nature that we're just getting things from nature without giving nature time to recover. And only after 1992, in 30 years, we've increased what we call the build capital, all buildings, houses, roads, by 100%, at the same time as nature has depleted by 40% over that period of time. So it's an amazing decline, and that's something we have to turn around. So that's why I wrote this book. I wanted to, to tell the story of how, in front of my, of my eyes, I've seen so much of the tropical rainforest I loved to disappear so quickly, and, and seeing those effects everywhere. You go to Borneo, you go to tropical Africa, you go to, you go to uh, South America, but also here in our own backyard, where the UK is one of the most depleted nations when it comes to nature. And the fact that there are so few species and habitats that are left in a healthy, stable population. And we've seen a major decline, for instance, in wetlands, and many, many species that are threatened of birds, mammals, plants. So this decline is ubiquitous, and it's something we absolutely have to do something about. But when I talk about biodiversity, one thing I really wanted to show in the book is that biodiversity is perhaps not something that is familiar to everyone here. If you just close your, eye, your eyes for a second, and I say the word biodiversity, what do you think about? What comes to your mind? Anyone here would like to share? Flowers, Flowers and bees. Thank you. What did, what did you think about? The cork? Fantastic. The cork around the tree. Just see. I mean, we could have a full survey here, but that would take all my 15 minutes. So I don't think I'm allowed to do that. But just see the variety, the diversity of biodiversity concepts. And biodiversity is just like climate. If you think about climate, most people think about, yes, temperature, right? It's hot. But think about rain, rainfall. We haven't had a lot of rain. Look at the grass outside. So climate is about temperature, about how much it rains, precipitation. It's about the seasonality, about the change we're seeing. And so is biodiversity. It's more than just species. You can just use your hand and see that there are five components of biodiversity. The first one is the genetic diversity, what we have in our genes. We're all parts of the same species, and despite the fact we have so many different cultures, we have different backgrounds, different values, we look different, we have actually a tiny genetic diversity among humans. But there's a huge diversity among many other species. Fruit flies in South America, they look all the same, but they have about 10 to 20 times more genetic diversity than we have here as humans. The second component is species, and that's what most people talk about. But species are not universal units, and it's very important that we also think about genetic diversity, as I said, because that's what's going to make species, some different cultivars of uh, apples, for instance, more resi resilient to climate change uh, than others. The third one is functions. What kind of functions, what kind of roles do species have in an ecosystem? If you just think about this small bird that we're talking about, probably a rain, it 
consumes small insects in the forest. But there are other species. We've got some parakeets here in, in Kewarnas. It eats, they have a very different lifestyle. So they have different roles, different functions in the ecosystem. So it's really important to think of ecosystems some, such as a forest as a combination of trees, of all the fungi in the soil, of the, of the birds that make nests for other birds, of the mosses that we're going to hear about today, and many other organisms. So the different roles they play. And then we have something that very few people think about, which is evolution. We've had life on this planet for a, at least three billion years. So we are here standing on the shoulders of giants that came before us. And that the evolutionary process made us so fit for this planet. We can breathe the, this air, we can drink water. Everything that we can do is because evolution has made us fit for this planet. And evolutionary history is something that gives some branches on the tree of life a much better resilience against climate change or other threats. And the last one is ecosystems. It's the biggest component of biodiversity. It's what we see here. That's why we have different buildings in this, this green, greenhouse. It's the temperate uh, glasshouse, but you see that we have some different climatic conditions. And that's the same in the other warm glasshouses where every species is adapted to one particular environment, one climate zone, for instance. And that's what gives this planet such an amazing diversity of life forms, because every, every species is adapted to a different condition. So we need biodiversity. Biodiversity now needs us. And despite the fact that so many species are threatened, and that there's so much despair, really, when I come to my colleagues, my family in Brazil, I, I am an incredible optimist, because I really think and I know that it is possible to bend the curve on biodiversity loss. Out of all the research we've done at Q, over the last two years, we've published more than 1,400 articles that demonstrate, combined, the power of science to tackle this, the climate change and biodiversity loss that we're seeing today. We know that there's time. It's not much, but we know how to do it. And it's about conserving what we've got and restoring what we've left, what, we've, uh, what it's gone. And we know that we can now use information about where species are. We can use the Millennium Seed Bank, which is the world's largest collection of seeds, to understand what species need in terms of growing and to use those seeds to restore some of those habitats that have gone lost. And last year in December, I was privileged to be part of COP15, so the Conference of the Parties in Montreal, where the most ambitious environmental pact ever produced was signed by almost 200 countries. So the global biodiversity framework that stretched to 2030 is now committing all those nations to protect 30% of this planet by 2030. We at Q are really keen that those 30% are going to be the right ones. That it's not only to be about birds or mammals, but also about all elements of biodiversity, about the different species, the different genetic diversity, and all those components that I just told you about. And we believe that this is feasible. We need to have of course, the financial systems, but also the knowledge and the science to support the best decisions about what to protect, how, and where. And it's also not something that only governments are going to do. It's something that each one of us can and should be contributing to. And I think, and I'm absolutely sure, that each one of us here can do more. I think we can all think about what we consume. Every time we spend one pound, think about that pound? Is it going, going to contribute to deforestation in the Amazon? Or is it actually going to be a sustainable choice which will allow nature to recover itself? Our power of consumption, our investments, our pensions, who we vote for, what we bring into our houses in terms of furniture, in terms of food, all those things matter. And each of the actions we take every day matter. Just a couple of months ago, I went back to my home place in Brazil, in Eastern Brazil, and to the rainforest that, where I used to play as a child. And now I'm very pleased to be leading on a project to try and conserve and restore a lot of that rainforest. We discovered new species, perhaps eight new species of fungi in a single day by bringing together my scientists here from Kew, my colleagues who are experts on different groups of organisms. So at the same time as we're making new discoveries every year, I'm also pleased to see that we are actually making a positive contribution. And I really hope that all of us, if we 
if we join ourselves in this major mission, I really hope we can bend this carbon biodiversity loss and restore nature. Thank you.